let us know what are the, or should be the research priorities for the treatment of early breast cancer. Wrong end of the country, Fatima. <laughs> I just said wrong end of the country, Fatima. Toronto, not Vancouver. Um, I got really excited to be, I was really excited to be invited to give this talk. I'm a fill-in, uh, but I got even more excited when I saw Dr. Weber getting up with head microphone on because I thought I might get to wear one too. And I always like that because it makes me feel sort of like um, Madonna. <laughs> and I always look forward to that, but... Uh, I guess, I guess not today, but this may be the first and the last time that I've been asked to fill in for Dr. Baselga, who was supposed to be giving this talk on a slightly different topic. And what I've been asked to talk about is research priorities in the treatment of early breast cancer. I should say that um, I'm retired from active patient practice now for between one and a half and two years, and so I'm seeing the world from perhaps through different lenses. And living with a chronic disease, another chronic disease myself, I see things from a different point of view, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, along with talking about some of the research that's been done in this area. I've listed my conflicts of interest, and I think they're also different from Dr. Baselga. <laughs> Not as large, certainly, perhaps. So what I did is I took the 15, the 15 top research questions that Mitch Dowsett put forward, and I'm going to say that's 15 years ago, I think, at this meeting, and I've simplified them. And the topics, the research questions, and I think these are the research questions that are important for patients as well as physicians. The research questions, why has my countdown stopped? I'm allowed to talk as long as I want. It's not working, Kathy, but oh, okay. we'll, we'll keep track. Don't worry. Um, Let's go. I was just glancing at it to see where it was at. Um, the research questions I've simplified into easy, short topics. And the first two involved whether we should have chemotherapy or not, and if so, what type. Uh, one was DCIS, which has been talked about today. How bad is it? How dangerous is it? Stem cells, which is a, perhaps a scientific question, um, dating, going to the basic biology of breast cancer. Uh, the unmet need in triple negative disease. Prognosis and trying to determine who would benefit from different therapies as well as straight prognosis. And new approaches, eight, nine, and 10 really are looking for, eight and nine at least are really looking for new approaches which patients as well as doctors welcome. Um, the last ones were mainly about endocrine therapy, overcoming resistance, consensus in how we tell patients and how we put together our concepts of what the cancer is going to be, what phenotype it's going to be from the basic science and pathology inputs. Uh, endocrine therapy again, imaging, which is on the screening end of things, uh, and again, another endocrine therapy perception, and Herceptin and its duration. Which, as Martine outlined, is still perhaps an open question 15 years later. It's interesting how many of these are still important. I have to say, as I have gone out of active practice, my consulting practice consists mainly of friends who have various malignancies. And this really gives you a little insight onto the um, situation. Patient information, which was under 6, 7, and 11 of Mitch's top 15, has to be correct, accurate, complete, and early. I had a friend recently, actually a retired pediatrician, who was diagnosed with a lymphoma. She, her family doctor referred her in, actually, to my hospital. And they phoned her back and said, well, in a week we'll go over your data and see if we're going to accept you or not, and then something else will happen. And she had no idea what this meant, where, it, where this week came from, what was going to happen at the end of the week, et cetera. 
I was able to put her on to somebody who actually explained that the week was because we're not supposed to accept patients outside of our catchment areas, and she was outside of either the catchment area of our hospital, Sunnybrook, or the Princess Margaret, and therefore she had to wait a week till they could decide whether they were going to see her or not. In actual fact, that particular subgroup, the lymphoma subgroup, was not even deciding whether to accept patients based on that, that criteria. And so she got a piece of information that was just neither accurate, complete, correct, or early enough to help her. And that's not going to be solved by research. I think it's more of a navigation and nurse navigation issue. But it's amazing how important this is to patients and how from our side we don't always see it as physicians. The patient information area comes around the stem cells for prevention and computing how high risk DCIS and early changes like this are. Of course, what all patients would like, what we would like, is to be able to cure these cancers or never to have them come at all, or to turn them into chronic diseases that could be well controlled. And as Martine outlined, we're getting better at that with endocrine therapy, better at that with anti-HER2 therapies, and that's coming along. Information and navigation, I think I've mentioned, are really, really important. And research in those areas, Leslie talked very um, well, I think, about communicating risk and communicating quality uh, and measuring quality of life so that we can give patients good information about how they're going to feel after they have their treatments and what choices they can make. And that's extremely important. I just put in this because I think it's something we don't think about. Good health is a crown worn by the healthy that only the ill can see. And something to think about as we're moving through. Another one of my friend consultations involved a patient who had breast cancer and was getting an, an inflatable implant. And um, she was told to go for her implant inflations for, on day X, Y, Z, and Q. And then after that, she was going to go for her radiation planning. Unfortunately, one of the inf inflations got delayed, and she ended up at her radiation planning two days before she'd had her last inflation. Well, as you can clearly see when you think about it for two minutes, even a radiation oncologist can figure out that you can't have your planning until your breast is the size it's going to be. And so that was a piece of navigation that fell through the cracks between her appointments and her, um, at, which were at two different hospitals, but nobody seemed to know what the other was doing. The navigation through the system is really, really important, and I hope it's improving. I think it's in some ways improving and in some ways not, but I think it's a really important area. I don't think it's a, a place for research as much as a place for some common sense. The patient perspective also involves a smooth flow through the system, a minimum waiting period, the fewest tests, and the fewest side effects. And I think with the new um, targeted drugs added to endocrine therapy, we're perhaps, at least in my setting, have been adding them to almost everybody we can. And I think for some patients, they're clearly a group of patients that are and aren't going to benefit more or less from those added therapies, and quite a few more tests and quite a few more side effects that are going to be added. And if we could find ways to um, figure out which ones are going to benefit from the beginning, it would obviously be an advantage. So unmet needs remain many of the same ones that Mitch and his group outlined uh, so long ago. And those involve triple negative disease, where we really learned that we haven't made too much progress, perhaps a little bit. Um, targeting on the CDK inhibitors, the mTOR inhibitors, and other biologics. And this is also involves knowing about the basic science of these tumors, which will lead to the new treatments. So we may get totally new agents, improved adjuvant regimens, which I think are coming. And the problem that we've all been focusing on quite a bit in the Oxford overview, and as Martine mentioned, with the longer trials of endocrine therapy, the problem of late recurrence which is largely an endocrine-sensitive disease problem. Less chemotherapy were indicated. Perhaps the word immunotherapy didn't come into uh, Mitch and his group's assessment, but I think it's an important area and probably is a, I guess that you could call it a targeted therapy.
area, but it's a new, a new word in the breast cancer lexicon, really. So we need research on the basic understanding of biology and on the basic delivery of care. And I think all of our patients and ourselves would agree that these are the important parameters. And with that, I'm going to close. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I have still eight any I have still eight minutes and forty three seconds to go according to this clock. If anyone has a question, please go to the microphone. No. Can't see any. Okay, then uh, it seems to be clear. Could Thank I ask you. a question, please? Uh, Hello. Hello. Where are you? Which, I can't uh, see okay. you out there, but number microphone eight. number eight. <laughs> Hello, Kathy. Um, Leslie Fallowfield. Thank you Hi, very Leslie. much <laughs> for stepping slightly outside of your comfort zone, but showing that you're very much within it. And one of the things that I just wanted to sort of make a comment about and ask you about is that a long time ago, when I was going to present some very complicated data about a, another area. Um, my supervisor said, why did you miss out the most important part of your study and research? And I said, well, I've only got 10 minutes and um, it's far too complicated for the audience to understand that bit. And he actually said, Leslie, if you actually can't make something complicated simple enough to get over, to an audience in a few minutes, then you know something? I don't think you understand what you're talking about. And I think he was quite right. And sometimes when I'm listening to videotapes and, and recordings of doctors talking about what we know to be incredibly complicated logic for you know, why you're making one recommendation rather than another, I often think about you know, what my supervisor said. And I guess my question to you is that even when one is very experienced, very skilled, very long in the tooth, don't you think we do really need to go back to basics and learn how to put complicated information into simple terms? Because otherwise patients can't make informed choices. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Leslie and I talked about this perhaps over a few glasses of wine last night. Um, but I, I think many of us, much less our patients, don't understand the probabilities and the difference between proportional reduction and absolute reduction. And clearly, it's not easy to explain them well to patients, even more sophisticated patients. Every once in a while, I get a statistician who goes, I got it. Don't bother explaining that to me anymore. But um, that's the rare exception. And I, I think that it's very important that before we go farther, we're able to tell the patient what sort of prognosis they have, treated and untreated. And they can look at that in both an absolute and a proportionate way, both of which are very valid, I think. So I, yes, I think that's an extremely important point. Okay, the la thank you. The last word of the conference and of this session will have Eric Weiner. Right. Microphone number one, please. Uh, Actually, Kathy's going to Oh, Kathy's I can see Eric. I couldn't find Leslie at all. I don't know where she was. Kathy's going to get the last word because it's a question. Yeah. <laughs> so as Monica told us, um, the surgeons mm -hmm. aren't breaking the bank. I don't necessarily think the radiation oncologists are breaking the bank. But in medical oncology, where we've seen a huge number of new therapies and some real advances over the past few years, we're going to go broke. Um, yes. And uh, you know, we can all design regimens that, that could cost half a million dollars a year in US dollars quite easily. So how are we going to deal with this? Uh, I don't know, but I think we're, I think we're a, if I may be political, I think we're a step ahead of you in Canada with the single payer system where we're able and are beginning to actually be hard negotiators on prices of drugs and where many drugs that were used in breast cancer, bevacizumab would be an example, were never funded in Canada. 
and probably shouldn't have been funded anywhere, as it turns out, as, uh, for, for breast cancer anyway. And I, I think that's a step in the right direction, but it's clearly got to change in some of the maverick activity of some pharma companies, even with really old drugs in other areas, has been not what one would hope for. So I don't know that I know the answer to that any more than world peace, but I think having a single negotiator is at least a step in the right direction. Maybe it'll be easier to solve than world peace. <laughs> hope so. Thank you. I want to uh, close the session and thank all the contributors uh, to the session who did an excellent job.